Hello, guys. Thank you so very much for joining me once again. I appreciate the fact that you create time to have time to listen to God's word from time to time. And today's program is unique in the sense that the, the style is different. Today, I have a special guest. I'm interviewing a very wonderful brother. I've known him for several years, upward of 10 years or more. Uh, myself and brother Charles Babiloni, we used to live together in a set of a block of flats in a suburb of Lagos, Nigeria. And as soon as I found out that he was a missionary, the attraction began. We built a relationship. And in spite of distance, because today he's serving as a missionary in France, we still keep in touch. Because we've been teaching about evangelism and sharing our faith, I thought, oh, let's talk to someone who is in the front lines and his name came to mind. So without much ado, I'd like to hand over to Brother Charles. Brother Charles, you're welcome to the program. Do you mind saying hi to our audience and telling them a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much, Bro Babs. This is a great privilege to be able to be part of this program. I have watched a couple of the teachings and I really appreciate them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. I thank you for asking me to be part of this. Uh, so my name is Charles Babaloni and I'm from Ghana in Africa or West Africa. My wife is called Deborah and she's from Nigeria. We have two boys who are 20 and 16 respectively. Uh, Jonathan and David. And yes, we work with a mission organization called Calvary Ministries or CAPRO based in Nigeria, but right now serving in several countries of the world. So this is a bit about us. Yeah. About All right. Me. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that uh, overview. So uh, you are a missionary. C can you tell me what factors influenced your becoming a missionary? Have you always become a missionary? What, what led to you becoming a missionary? Well, actually, I was brought to the Lord by Calvary Ministries or Capro Missionaries when I was in Senegal. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm from Ghana, but I had to relocate to Senegal to join my mom who had remarried to a Senegalese. So I went to join my mom in Senegal and it was in Senegal that missionaries sent from Nigeria by Calvary Ministries, Capro, led me to the Lord. And when I came to the Lord, growing up with them, I went to serve one day on board a ship. It's actually a ship owned by a mission group called Operation Mobilization, OM. They have a ship or even I think several ships and they go from country to country evangelizing. And so they came to Senegal this particular year. I think that was 1990. And I was among the volunteers that worked on board this ship. And on board this ship was a couple from Calvary Ministries, Capro. They were also working. So on board this ship was a couple from Calvary Ministries, Capro in Nigeria. They were working with Operation Mobilization. And so as I served on board the ship for about two weeks, I got to know them and we had time talking together. And so one day he asked me, Charles, what do you want to do with your life? Mm. And I had already thought of that in cause of time growing in the Lord. I had thought of that. And so I told him, mm, maybe an evangelist. I don't know yet, but I'm praying maybe an evangelist. So he asked me, Point blank, have you thought of becoming a missionary? Mm. And to be honest, I had not thought of that. So I told him, no, I haven't. But the week that followed, 
I usually do my quiet time, even, even up to now, my quiet time, I go book by book. That, that, that means that if I'm reading Philippians, I will read like the whole chapter one today or part of chapter one, and then I will continue the next day. I, that's how I've been doing my quiet time all the, all the while. So I was reading Philippians um, that week. And so I got to Philippians chapter two, and my eyes were like opened. I was seeing how Jesus left his glory, power, majesty, his throne in heaven and came to earth. And in my spirit mind or spirit man, I was seeing earth in those days, not earth in these days. Remember, that was about 1990 or 1991. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of earth 2000 years ago. That must have been more remote, more difficult terrain. And yet he came to earth 2000 years ago and lived on this earth in order that I might be saved. And I heard a question clearly, a very clear question coming to me. Would you also be willing to leave the city, all the comfort of city life and go to remote areas so that others might be saved? And then Brother Nee, where the brother I met, the couple brother, he's called Nee. Brother Nee's question came to my mind. What do you want to do with your life? Do you? And then he asked me if I would like to be a missionary. And so it came to me so strong that God wanted me to be a missionary. And I remember breaking down in tears. I was very ambitious. Wow. Breaking down in tears and weeping. And so later, later on, that day or the next, I went to talk to the missionary. That was, he was the one who discipled me on the ground. And then we began the process of becoming, being trained in becoming a missionary eventually. Mm. That's yeah. a little bit of the story. Wow. As they say, the, the rest is history. You are living that experience today. Obviously, it wasn't an easy decision for you, was it? Because being a missionary is a lot of work, to be honest. How, how has the journey been between that time and now? I would say it's been exciting. It's been a lifetime of learning to work with the Lord. I would not deny the fact that there have been difficult times, trying times. Um, sometimes when I read what Paul says in the book of Corinthians, where he says we like struck down but not defeated, you know, that kind of thing. We, we have gone through that. I've seen that. It's, it's, but at the end, it's fulfilling. Mm. It's, mm. it's exciting. It's like you, you live in a life that not many people are living like we are living in france right now one of the most expensive countries in the whole world wow. and when some people get to know that we don't have a salary i mean we don't earn a salary in france they, they like so how do you live and we have never gone begging anyone please give us money to pay our rent or give us money to feed or give us money for our kids. We, we, we've not done that. And sometimes we are even the one that blesses, we bless others also. And they feel like, how can you, how can you live in this nation and not receive salary and yet survive? So yes, yeah, that's, the, that's the exciting part of, of it. Mm. That knowing that uh, you live a life that is unique and it brings fulfillment. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Obviously, you must have received a lot of support from your wife because if the support is not there, it's, it's not easy to weather those uh, difficult moments. You also spoke about, you know, the scriptures that keep you going where Paul spoke about, you know, um, being down but not out and all of those. Okay, so you, you mentioned being prepared immediately after you got the call. Uh, was it an institution or an individual? Who would you say is the most influential figure in terms of preparing you 
for what you are doing today, the mission work? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, two, two men brought me to the Lord. They were single brothers that time sent by Calvary Ministries Capro to Senegal. They were the, the ones that led me to the Lord. But one of them in particular, his name is Muhammad Sadiq. He came from a Muslim background in, in northern part of Nigeria or the Middle Belt somewhere. And um, he was the one that really influenced my life and touched my life. He lived a very simple life. He used to be a nurse in, in I, I think, Mulonfashi Hospital, somewhere in the north, mm -hmm. and he resigned to go into missions. But he used to be living such a simple life, and all his life was entirely based on the word of God. I would say everything about him was dependent on the word of God, and he, he impacted my life. Mm. He did. I learned a lot from him. Yes, I did go to Capro's School of Missions uh, 12 months program, but I want to believe that the foundation had been laid by Brother Mohammed Sadiq. Uh, his teachings, or mostly his life, his life impacted me mm. greatly. Yeah, as a, as a new convert. Well, we thank God for him. Just out of out of curiosity, are you still in touch with him today? Yes, uh, only he's not on WhatsApp. The last time I had to call him, I had to call him. Well, we can call it to Nigeria numbers through Telbo. We don't pay a lot using Telbo. It's an internet call also, but mm -hmm. it's not free like mm -hmm. uh, like WhatsApp. But yes, uh, I called him. Some time ago, I've forgotten how long, but some months ago, and I, he's working, he's right now working as one of the trainers in Capro's School of Missions. Mm -hmm. He's a, what, what do you call, he's a trainer in Capro's School of Missions. Bro Mohammed, one of the things that he really also impacted me was his prayer life. He was mm -hmm. a man of prayer. Wow. And that <clears throat> impacted me greatly. I, I I grew up in the Lord under a man of prayer. And 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 I saw that, I mean, God answers prayer. Mm. He is a God that answers prayer. Amazing. And I think we, we cannot but just pick that challenge from him. If he impacted you, you have a responsibility to impact others, be a model, as well as myself and all the people who are watching us that we need to um, impact the younger generation. For me and the ministry I lead, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 has been like the anchor scripture, you know, Paul saying to Timothy, the things that you have heard me teach among many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach other men also. We just trust God that he will help us to be uh, faithful in this work. So, Amen. You said that, you know, there is excitement in terms of trusting God in the missions we work. Of course, there are challenges. Now, when I knew you, you, you weren't speaking French. I knew you were speaking English. And today, I, I would not even bother to say beyond bonjour. Otherwise, you, you will lose me. Um, would you say there are some interesting moments, maybe humorous moments in terms of um, dealing with a totally different culture? Did you have any exciting or interesting story like that? Oh, yes, we have had very interesting stories, but I, I'll just maybe tell one, just one of them. Uh, when we came to France, not very, very long after we arrived, uh, we were, at that time, we were part of a church. This church didn't have a pastor, and mm. so uh, kind of we were uh, in several areas and they even asked me to be part of the leadership for a while and uh, and so this day there was a wedding in the church two people were getting wedded and i was asked to preach to bring the message and i, I as i was preaching i quoted first peter 3 7 where the scriptures asked husbands to honor their wives and in french is the same way he's put honorary for the for farm honor your wife but i didn't know that it has that phrase have 
it has a completely different meaning too in the French culture. I know your wife. So people were laughing. I was like, what's happening? I was telling, okay, I was telling the the to be husband, because it was before the, the, the exchange vows, honor your wife, honor her. Or like re- give her honor and respect, you know, like don't look down on her, don't say mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that kind of advice. Honor her as the Bible is saying. And I didn't know that in France, in France particularly, it means something. It means like, you know, give to her what she she wants in terms in sexual terms. I didn't know it. <laughs> People were really laughing. And I was uh, I was all that I was repeating it. I didn't know that it was like, oh, what is this saying? Kind of. It was later on that one of the elders in the church, one of the men and said, This is what it means in France. I, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I guess it comes with, with the uh, environment when you have moved to a new environment. W- what would you say needs to be done to avoid such in terms of, you know, culture shock or making mistakes? Thank God, it's a little embarrassing, but interesting and funny. Um, it, it could be worse in some cases. But what would you say someone who is moving to a new environment needs to do to avoid this kind of uh, embarrassment or culture shock? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Cross cultural ministry, one needs to learn the language and the culture very well. You know, language and culture very often are tied together. Like in this, in this case, it's true, very embarrassing. But language and culture are so tied together that one needs to learn the language and the culture very well. Although you will get to a point that ah, you've been in a country for so many years. It's, oh, I, have, I haven't discovered this. I'm still learning. I have a French, a French friend that I've been following up for some years now. And he keeps telling me things about France and the language. Even recently, maybe about two, three weeks ago, he was telling me something. I said, is that so? I didn't know. And so, yeah, we keep learning, but one has to have an attitude of learning the culture and the language in terms of cross-cultural ministry is very important so that we don't make some very serious mistakes. Some some missionaries have made some very serious mistakes Mm. and we we, we would like to avoid that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I mean, I, I became a Christian in the late 80s, and I remember reading a book. Well, I didn't read it. I just saw it by Keith Green, the late Keith Green, Why mm-hmm. You Must Go to the Mission Field. So mm-hmm. if, some, if you were to tell somebody, why should I go to the mission field? Good. Well, first of all, the Lord gave a command. He says, Go into all the world so at this point i can say that every believer has to obey that command Mm. although not everyone will pack his luggage and go although some who think they are not called to go may actually be called to go but Mm. every believer in his heart has to be ready to go in the sense that thinking of the world, the mission field as as um, a call. I have a call to the mission field. What can I do? And discovering what can I do now? If somebody really receives a clear call to pack, go means for me pack my things and go. Mm. My advice would be obey the Lord mm. because. The reward that we are going to receive in heaven, nothing can be compared to it. Mm. I remember when I was in Cote d'Ivoire, so after I have finished serving with Cabri Ministries School of Missions in, in Nigeria, I was sent to Cote d'Ivoire to do what we call a probationary year before I was sent back to Senegal. And remember, I came to Christ in Senegal, and my desire was to go back to Senegal because it was, I mean, it's it still a very enriched people group. So my desire was to go back to Senegal, but I was sent to Cote d'Ivoire to serve a probationary year before I went to Senegal. And I worked with an Ivorian brother. Uh, he, he was with Capro too. And he said something that really touched me. He said, if 
we are trusting God. We are believing. We have faith that one day we will live a life of eternity with God. Where we will eat, we will drink. I mean, we will live eternally with him. How, how can we cannot trust him to take care of us here for a short time if he calls us to go into mission field? And, that, and that's one of the main obstacles that people face. How will I survive financially, materially, if I pack my things and go? But this brother is called Brother Benjamin. Brother Benjamin's advice, I think all phrase comes to mind that if God will provide for me for all eternity. Will he not take care of me this short time if I mm. obey him? Mm. So yes, he's faithful. If he really calls one to go, we need to obey him and pack and go. And thank you very much for that. Your life has been a testament to the fact that if God calls you, then he will take care of you. Like you said, you have never begged. In fact, it was exciting to know that you even... You, you have the opportunity to be a blessing to other people. So if anyone is watching, you feel like, you know, leaving the comfort of your environment and going elsewhere. Uh, but what makes you, keeps you back is the fact that you're afraid, am I going to eat? Am I going to feed my family? Just know that you are not the first. And God's work being done by God's man in God's way will never lack any provision. Just look at people around you and you have somebody on the screen who has been living that for very many years and he has not begged. We thank God for that. So you are in France. Can you tell me why, why France and how, what is unique about France? Tell us more about the work you are doing in France. Well, in 2002, we were still in Senegal and um, <clears throat> Capro was working very closely with another mission group called youth with a mission. In fact, the church that uh, we were pastoring or leading was a church that was begun by YWAM. Youth with a mission means YWAM. And YWAM turned it over to Capro because in their, in their principles, when they begin a church, they have to turn it over to a church or a mission organization. And so when Capro took over the leadership of that church, several of the Y1 missionaries remained, stayed as members on, and as the workers they helped in, in the church. And one of them was a friend, a close friend, Brian from America. And uh, he got engaged to a French lady who was also working with Y1 as a missionary with Y1. And the wedding took place in France. And so I, I came to attend the wedding here. And after the court wedding or at the, the mayor's office wedding, when they were doing the pictures and uh, I, it was my turn, I was the only one that came from Senegal directly. Uh, it was my turn to take picture with them and I stood by them. After the picture, when I stepped aside, I heard in my heart clearly the Lord says, you will come back here and preach the gospel. It was so clear that I could not deny God has spoken to me. But then I gave it my own interpretation because we were in a stage whereby we needed to groom the church in Senegal and really make it stand firm. So I never imagined coming to France to stay. So I thought, okay, maybe there will be open doors for me to come to France and preach the gospel. And so when I went back home, after the wedding, I didn't even tell my wife, this is what the Lord, this is what I heard. To me, well, if is the Lord, he will open doors. And, and that same year, I, I got an open door to go to the U.S. that same year. So I thought, okay, this is a fulfillment of the word. Like, there will be open doors to go to the Western world and preach, preach to people, whatever. So I, for, I, I just thought this is fulfillment. But then two years after, 2004, we were then, um, we were then praying about having a structure, a church building, a structure for the church to meet in because the church was growing in numbers. And uh, anytime we rent a place to use, the neighborhood, because it's a Muslim neighborhood, neighborhood will 
tell the house owner, no, don't, don't let them use your house and all that. And we were really growing in number. Actually, at that time in Dakar, Dakar the capital city, the Capro Church was the church with the largest number of Senegalese people. Wow. We were really growing. <clears throat> and we, we even got prosecuted somewhere. We came to attack us and all that. So, well, we were now praying. We were in a mood of fasting and pray, prayer for the Lord to really do something and provide for us a place where we can, we can say this is our own building that we are using. And in the course of this fasting and prayer time, we were praying in the clinic because YWAM owned a dispensary or a clinic. And we were praying in the clinic, I think, one Sunday afternoon because they don't work Sunday, Sunday, Sunday afternoons. So we were praying and Deborah, my wife, heard the Lord tell her clearly, your next step will be France. This was 2004, I think. And when she told me, I said, France, I mean, what are we going to do in France? I, I, I didn't really, I didn't think, well, I remember what I heard the Lord say, but I felt like, oh no, it's a uh, it's way of kind of, well, she, she was very, very sure the Lord spoke to her. She was very convinced. She had no doubt that she heard the Lord speak to her during that time of fasting and prayer. And so we, well, around that time too, one of the church members saw in a dream me telling her that we were going to leave Senegal soon. Yeah. And as I was saying, the church was growing in number. And by the time 2006 came, we had, we had had a church in the U.S. that had gotten in touch with us and they were going to give us the support, financial support to buy and build a structure. <clears throat> this same brother from uh, U.S. that I came to attend his wedding, mm. he He's a medical doctor. He had made some savings in the U.S. before he came into missions, and he was ready to give some of his savings to the church. He actually gave mm -hmm. some of it. Well, short story, we had the financial support to build the, the a building for the church. And so if, even before, I really felt the Lord saying from that time on that we need to begin to prepare the leadership of the church and and leave so and so we now began to prepare the church for our our departure and we left by 2006 and went back to nigeria by that time we had been able to build the building and all that and when we went to nigeria i was really tired i was tired physically tired and uh, we had we had to also pray to find out what next but as we were praying to find out what next resting and praying France kept coming on. France kept coming on. And so we went to share this with our leader, the Calvary Ministries Capro International Director. And he said, oh, if you had told me this, you would have been in France already. That there is a ministry in France asking us to send them workers. Wow. So it's like, okay. So from that time, it was like, get yourself ready. Look for your support. Prepare. Wow. So he wrote to the ministry in France that, oh, we have someone to, for, to send to you. They said, okay, send them to rest and all that. It was like so, so like prepared and arranged. And then when we were going to go for a visa to come to France, one of our leaders, in fact, the same brother I, I met on board the Lagos ship, if you remember, who asked me if I would like to be a missionary, if I felt a missionary. He was now one of the main leaders in Capro. So he said, well, if God gives you a visa, if you get a visa rather, then we know God is really in this call. So we went to apply for a visa to the French embassy and there was no headache. I mean, it's like they gave us the visa, long-term visa, not just short-term. They gave us a long-term visa coming to France to stay for long-term. It was like... I, I saw with my eyes the day I went to collect my visa, many people who, who came in their big, big cars, they dropped them off to come and receive their response. They gave them response, no, 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 no. And here I was, and I, 
they, they came for business visas or mm -hmm. busy visas. They said, no, and here I was. And they gave me the four passports for the four of us. And all was visa, long-term visa. It was like, when I took it back, I mean, they knew this is God's, God calling us here. It's not, it's not a man-made man something. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we thank God. And, and I can relate to the miracle because that's what I consider it to be of the visa because I've been to France a couple of times. Believe me, not only was this short, that was the time they told me, when you come back, bring this sleep. Short visa, yet I still had to report to the embassy. So for you to get a long-term uh, visa, that must have been a miracle. We thank God. So if there are people watching you, they are interested in reaching out to you, how can they reach you? You will have an email address or you have a website you want them to contact you on. Yeah, well, not a website yet. We have been thinking of it, but we have an email address, thebavalonis at gmail.com, T-H-E, Babylonis, surname at gmail.com. We have a WhatsApp number as well. Well, we are on Signal, Telegram, and all these um, platforms with the same number. I can, I can, or you, I think you have my number, perhaps. Yeah, so yes, one can be reached by email, by WhatsApp, by Telegram, Signal. Facebook as well, you know, mm -hmm. Facebook. And recently I started um, a YouTube short teachings but well, that, that's that's for teaching. But to get in touch with us, really, I think by through Gmail, um, WhatsApp, or Telegram, or Signal, or Facebook. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Again, the email is thebavilonis at gmail.com. Of course, we are going to yeah. make sure we put it in uh, the chat box of whatever platform this is being uh, broadcast. Uh, this has been an interesting one. Uh, very curious question. Which of the languages do you speak better now, English or French? <laughs> well, I would say it's still English. With my wife at home, we communicate in English. Really? But I must admit that sometimes when I speak outside of home, I struggle to remember some words because... <laughs> Haven't lived more. Uh, we have. I've lived more in the French world than, than the English world. Wow! So, amazing, yeah. amazing. Anyway, final words for whoever is watching us. Uh, what is the wrap up of everything you have said for somebody who's been listening? Well, my word of encouragement will be that the Lord has done great things for us as human beings and he is asking so little from us what he is asking from us is so little compared to what he has done mm. and if we really look at what the lord has done we will not hesitate to do the small thing he is asking us he has done the big the big thing he's asking just a little effort from us and if we put on that little if each one, if every believer put in a little effort, that, that little effort the Lord is asking us together, I believe we will get this great commission, as it's called, into a great completion. Mm. Where the gospel will be taken to the ends of the world. All right. Thank you very much, Brother Charles. It's been a wonderful time speaking with you. Thank you for giving us uh, this much of your time. It, uh, I look forward to another opportunity, obviously, uh, when I have the opportunity. And I hope you will avail us the time. Thank you for giving yourself to the work of the Lord. And, you know, we trust that God will keep expanding the spheres of your influence. Once again, thank you. To our viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, I will keep in touch with you. I'll come on the same platform, same time. Thank you. God bless. Thank you so much, too. God's blessings. Thanks. Thanks.